welcome to the Auction Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors. We are Tribe.co. Natural sports nutrition delivered direct to you. You can get a free trial pack of six delicious energy bars, trail mix, recovery bars and shakes for just £1 by using the code OxygenAddict1. And also PrecisionHydration.com. Personalise your hydration strategy because the idea of one size fits all doesn't work for hydration. pH's electrolyte supplements match how you sweat, helping you prevent dehydration and cramp. You can get a free box or tube of precision hydration worth up to nine ninety nine with the code Oxygen Addict. It's a no brainer. And also big thanks to our patrons support the show with a monthly donation thank you very much thank you very much and patrons are 2017 start of 2018 patrons special edition patrons only podcast will be out this week so thank you all very much for supporting us really appreciate it you will be getting details through of how to uh, of how to get access to that podcast very soon hells i can hear birds cheeping in the background that's incredibly cool <laughs> g'day mate how's it going <laughs> <laughs> Helen is joining us all the way from sunny Australia. This, well, it's this very early morning for me, and this quite late in the evening for you, isn't it? Yeah, it's not too late at the moment. Quarter past four in the afternoon, which means it is very early in the morning for you. Um, but yeah, Rob, I made it here on Friday evening. I'm a little bit confused as to what day of the week it is, but I know it's Monday because it's podcast recording day. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I had a very very long flight, uh, but you. Please to know, Rob, I have done a little run. It was so hot and sweaty. It was minging. Uh, but it was amazing. I was in my best top and shorts. And it was hot. And uh, Brilliant. you can hear the palm trees swaying there in the breeze. Um, I'm in Brisbane at the moment. And then I go to Gold Coast uh, in a day or two. And that's when I start work. So it's all good. So I'm currently on holidays, feet up. Um, and Rob, oh, my God. So this morning I went swimming yeah and um it was amazing so it was the university like queensland university uh, aquatic center right they have a nine lane 50 meter pool nice and then just next to it a nine lane 25 meter pool you could literally well, pick your lane it was incredible you know, why build one when you can buy two for twice the price <laughs> that's the that's the way isn't it two pools together it was awesome. And uh, I went with my mum and uh, we got there and sort of paid. And I said, look at it, you know, being very British. I was like, uh, are there any um, rules as to how, how you're meant to swim here? And he's like, oh, no, it's really quiet. So you can pretty much pick where you want to go. So, yeah, no, it's easy. Too easy, mate. <laughs> Good accent as well. Very impressive. Yeah, it's not too bad, hey? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> it's making me feel warmer just listening to you. Oh, that's great. So you're off up to off up to Gold oh, Coast in a few days, yeah. and then the Commonwealth's kick off. Well, not very long away now, is it? No, really not. Uh, the fourth till the fifteenth. Um, you might even be able to hear an Aussie accent there. Yeah, in the background. A little bit of noise in the background of someone's. Yeah. Oh, how exciting! Yeah, this is the Mellies. <laughs> All... Welcome to the Murrays. All of the uh, the <laughs> listeners are extremely jealous of you right now. Um, I, I, I'm I pretty much having to pinch myself all the time. Um, yeah, I, I feel very lucky and very privileged to be here. Love so, it. Yeah, don't don't worry. I'm I'm feeling um, yeah super super grateful to to be here and to have the opportunity to be here. So um, yeah, it's 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 good. But I, I see that the sun was shining this weekend in the UK as well. So you didn't miss out there, Rob. Well, do you know what? It was shining up north, but it wasn't shining down south. I had a, oh, no. a little trip away with a dude down to Legoland. We got rained on all day Saturday, but you know, oh. nothing can nothing can damp the enthusiasm of a six year old at Legoland. And then Sunday was dry but not sunny. And then as we drove north again, we got sort of north of Birmingham clouds disappeared and everyone i've spoken to since i got back up was like oh what an incredible weekend it's been it's been amazing loads of people appeared at the cheshire cat in great weather and uh, i was like hmm <laughs> oh, but you know oh, sorry get, you bad weather. well getting to queue for the ninjago ride was made up for it all <laughs> okay good good i tell you what i did see rob uh photos of harlock uh which is now the always aim high 
uh, triathlon. And um, can you remember that was my second ever triathlon? And I, I've said many times about how horrendous it was and how it yeah. had to get sort of cancelled when I got back into T2 and I'd been blown off my bike into the ditch and oh, horrendous. This year was what I had imagined it would be like just beautiful blue skies and like incredible incredible north wales scenery it looked beautiful so yeah when when harlock is stunning and the sun is out it really is a sort of one of the wonders of wales i'd say rob yeah it's an amazing place isn't it i remember doing that's one of my first triathlons as well and it's just an incredible location and do they still finish with the the run up to the castle at that race I yeah wonder. totally oh yeah, yeah, yeah like the most the, i think <laughs> I went to recce that on my bike the year I did it and rode up the hill and was like, wow, this is really steep. And then the road out on the other side is even steeper. And it's the only time I've ever got off a bike because I thought I'm just going to go over the handlebars here if I try to go down, <laughs> try to go down this hill. It really is. Yeah. Really mental. Right now, I think I should mention before we go any further, loads of people have emailed us and tweeted us and stuff this week about problems they had downloading last week's show. So, Big apologies for that. Um, it's nothing at our end. Sometimes funky things happen with iTunes. So what I think I'm going to do is I'll have, well, by the time you hear this, I will have re-uploaded last week's episode as an entirely new episode. And let's hope that iTunes sorts itself out and uh, and, and, and re-picks it up. So again, our apologies from our end. We frantically tried to get things sorted in. There was seemingly nothing we could do. We couldn't get any support from Apple for it. So um, if things like that do happen again in the future, thanks for letting us know. Keep trying to download it. I was actually able to download it through iTunes to my phone, which made me think it was a temporary glitch. But then I was still getting an email off somebody last night actually saying they still couldn't get it. So it's a bit of a mystery as to what it is, whether people need to update their iTunes or the phones or whether it's something at iTunes end and it only lets certain people download it. I just don't know. But I've had it happen before with other people's podcasts and, and kind of assumed it would sort itself out. So let's hope that we don't have the same problems this week, Hells. Definitely. I've, I, I have had a similar issue, Rob, as well. And I ended up almost, you know, when you do have your uh, iTunes podcasts and yeah. you can sort of subscribe to it, I almost ended up, I guess, subscribing twice. So when I see icons in, um, in, on my phone for the yeah. podcasts, I have two for, for hours, definitely. And perhaps two for another one because it, it did just happen. They'd say it's not available. It's not available. But then it would work on the other icon. So it's very huh. strange. So yeah, maybe it is about having a play around. Yeah, and I had more success actually. I, I pressed play and listened to it streaming, and then it downloaded yep. afterwards. So maybe that's a trick for people as well. But anyway, sorry about that. On behalf of Apple, they're probably too busy spending their millions and billions of pounds to to answer the support email. <laughs> Doing research into the next toy. All right, so then let's kick off into the show, shall we? Let's see. Uh, let's see how we're cracking on there. The first thing we've got to bring you this week is news of the winner of our Tribe Triathlete of the Month award for March 2018, and the winner is Hells. Drum roll, please. Chris Barry. Yeah. So Chris Barry, uh, Chris, good on you, mate. You nominated yourself for this one. And I'm a big fan of people doing that because often we sit around and wait for people to know it's that we've done something and, and nobody does. So well done for letting us know. His email says, can I nominate myself, Rob? I've been really busy since the start of the year trying to get control of my weight and also running has been my weak area. Next week, I'll have lost a stone since the new year. I'm now weighing in at 15 stone. And yesterday, at Preston Park Run, I smashed my 5k PB by two minutes, which is massive, isn't it? So well done, yeah. Chris Barry. Um, um, you have... Absolutely. Sorry, go on, Hells. And we'll be sending... No, I was going to say, we'll be sending a load of tribe goodies, won't we? We certainly will. You'll get an 18 pack of goodies from Tribe and a T-shirt. If you can let us know by email what T-shirt size you are and uh, we'll get you sorted out with that. So thanks very much for Tribe for uh, for sponsoring that award for us. If you want to nominate yourself or somebody else for the April award, which will be coming up in four, four weeks time, you can send an email to help. Uh, sorry, to Helen at oxygenatic.com. Or you can email directly to help at auctionaddict.com this month as well, with Hells being away. Or you'll see us on Twitter or on Facebook. Let us know there who you'd like to nominate, and we'll get you in line for the tribe. For the delicious big pack of tribe goodies, Hells. 
Correct. It's it, oh yeah. I did, I've had some tribe bars recently, Rob. I think I was doing something just before I came out here, and uh, maybe I was on a course or something like that. And I was like, oh my god! I was just like, oh, I need, I need some food. I need something, just something to kind of tide <laughs> me over. And uh, yeah, their chalk salt, one of their bars, saw me three, Rob. I would have loved one of those for the the seventy point three that I did in Lanza. I got to race morning and went, I'm missing something. What am I? Oh, that little bag I had with race day nutrition is still on the table in my living room. Oh, you didn't? You yeah, didn't. I got to race day morning and, and Andy was like, Rob, you good to go? that's a schoolboy error. Yeah, it totally was. So there you go. Everyone makes them, even after nearly 20 years in the sport. So I managed to do a 70.3 with two bottles of watered down Coke on my bike bottles and... Um, and a waffle that I bought from the supermarket on race day morning. <laughs> on the tucked, way. <laughs> tucked, yeah, tucked down the back of my skin suit. <laughs> so I brought, you've got to imagine this, this massive waffle. It was literally about seven inches across. I'd crushed it up to get it in the little aero pocket thing. And as I sat up to eat it halfway through the bike, this guy passed me and looked over and he was like, nice. Not even stopping for a coffee to go with it. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, oh. so I wish I had the delicious tribe bar with me to, to sneak into the little bento box, but it didn't happen this time, Hells. So, Rob, how, how, bad was the, how bad was your run? Um, I, I was like just how tired. bad was the bonk? No, I was fine in terms of energy. Really? I was absolutely fine, yeah, I was totally Good. on it. Earlier in the week, I'd had a horrendous bonk. We'd been out for a long ride and uh, we'd, we'd sat down to get some calories in us in La Santa, the supermarket there. And Will Clark rode by and waved hello. And then when we set off, he'd waited for us down the road. So we had a good catch up. And I was riding next to Will chatting and forgot all about the fact I'd been exhausted and was just pretty excited to be riding next to Will and hearing about all his plans for Ironman Texas. And we went on the sort of the hilly road up out of La Santa and over the top and then the, the sort of long drag that comes out of Famara. And all of a sudden, I just started to see stars. And Will was just chatting away, so he wasn't riding very hard. So I said, Will, I'm goosed, mate. I'm going to have to let you go. Have a good ride. He was in the middle of a like an eight-hour ride at this point. So off he went. I dropped back to Andy. And Andy was like, good effort, mate. I've been holding threshold watts just trying to sit on the back of the group for the last 20 minutes. So I was absolutely oh destroyed. Literally had to get off the bike, sit down at the side of the road, pretend I needed a wee. And he was like, come on, let's get going. I was going, I really have to just sit here for a few minutes. I was completely ended by it. So, uh, <gasps> yeah. But it's amazing the difference that one week's riding makes to you. How, you know that theory that you won't get any fitter in a week? Well, you totally do. Yeah. You'd, I think it's different if you're kind of <gasps> tapering off your training for a race and that theory of well don't try and do too much in race week is absolutely valid but for us i i was just amazed how much stronger i was after six days riding on the bike than beforehand so yeah kicked off the season nicely for me back in back in the swing of it which is awesome that is really really cool you're saying then about um having to kind of you know go no 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 just you know taking my time taking my time when we went out for our run um it was yesterday yesterday morning um I had to keep on stopping for water, Rob. They, they had to fountains every so often yeah. along the river in Brisbane. But because obviously my last run was Wednesday morning in zero degrees, um, you know, freezing cold, beautiful early morning run, whatever. Then suddenly going to probably 25, 27 and like real, real humidity. I was just like, man alive. This is this is hard work. Cause it takes, yeah. It does take a while, doesn't it, to get the body used to like humidity again and yeah and just absolutely heat. yeah so whew, yeah and the amount of water that i can drink is just it's ridiculous yeah it'll it's be really interesting ridiculous. again to watch how quickly your body adapts to that because it'll happen really quickly in the heat yeah 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 i honestly rob i should be i should be racing somewhere really hot this summer i'll be like woohoo yeah <laughs> <be> fine maybe <laughs> we'll be having a heat wave in the uk when you get back maybe that'll be yeah uh... <laughs> Maybe that'll be what we'll uh, be attuning you for. And do you know what? That brings us nicely into our results sponsored by Precision Hydration. Because Hells has got to stay hydrated in the heat, haven't you, Hells? Correcto. And, and Rob, I have to keep the, uh, keep, keep, in the, keep the hat on my head as well. So I bought my pH cap out here. Loving it. So getting a bit of uh, Australian advertising in for Precision Hydration. Correct. <laughs> so remember, guys, if you're planning... 
if you're planning a hot training camp or you're planning a trip abroad like Hells has done, or you're even still hammering out the turbo sessions and sweating a lot, you need to keep on top of your electrolyte salts as well. I had a proper evening of calf cramps away in Lanzarote Hells after riding in the heat all day one day and not having taken care of this. It just takes one day for me to not to not take care of it and I wake at three o'clock in the morning with my calf in a vice. It's horrendous. And then all of a sudden take the precision hydrations back into the bottle the next day, get everything sorted and get the preps done and everything's golden. Calf cramps have gone away. So listeners, you can get yourself over to precision hydration if you've not tried it before. You get a free box or tube of Precision Hydration worth up to nine ninety nine with the code Oxygen Addict. You can get onto their uh, website and take the online sweat test precisely for triathletes if you've not done that before. And even if you're at one of the races that they're supporting or one of the um, uh, what they called hells, uh, like the talks. Yeah, well, one of those talk events. things, events, things. Yeah. Um, seminars that they do you can get your sweat tested in person as well so highly recommend that if you're racing in hot weather this year all right then so results from this week first up we've got the british duathlon champs happened over in bedford this weekend so traditional season they opener isn't did. it so yes it is men's race winners we had the men's elite results taken out by adam bowden in 5901, 42nd win over Morgan Davis, and third place was James Teagle. Over on the ladies' side, we had a win for Georgia Sweening from Julian Nimmo in second and Laura Smith in third. Good to see Susie Richards racing again, coming back from injury, back down there in 11th place. So, good result for her that I think coming back from injury hells. Cracking stuff. Uh, Rob, over in the uh, Philippines, it was the first 7.3 Davao City. Uh, and that was won by Mexico's Mauricio Mendez. And Radka Karlfeldt took the win in the women's race in her first race back since becoming a mum. Uh, Tim Van Berkel uh, and Tim Reed were also racing. So Tim Reed was second and Van Berkel third, with Crowey in fourth there. And then news of another race that went on while we were, we had the, we didn't do any news last week because it was being away. Um, down at 70.3 Campeche in Mexico, we had another win three weeks in a row for Terenza Bazzone, which that's a, that's a tasty little winning streak there, isn't it, hey? In, in within a space of three weeks, very tasty. That very is tasty. You see, yeah. And nice it ended in peak. completely different countries as well. Yeah, so it'd be dead interesting to get him on and hear about the travel schedule and how he how he bounces back to such a high level of racing. Because, I mean, look at the results here. He's won it from Michael Weiss in second, Rodolfo von Berg in third, and Matt Hansen's in there as well. So quality field. Um, so it'd be interesting to know how he how he manages the travel schedule around all of that. To, to, it's one thing racing at that level, but to do it week in and week out and travel as well is pretty cool. Yeah, you should uh, get, get in contact with him, Rob. Absolutely. We'll get on that this week. And then the women's race was taken out by Heather Wertel from Lauren Brandon in second and Angela Nath in third. Uh, Lindsay Corbin in fourth. So again, a, a quality field for an early season opener there, hey? Oh, yeah, totally. It's um, This is a time of year, isn't it, when when they're all getting getting ready and, and season openers and Oceanside's going to be on in, what, a week or two, isn't it? Yeah, sure uh, is. And that'll be, yeah, so Sanders and... Um, Jan Fredina are going to be racing that one Heather Jackson who we had on a couple of weeks ago she'll be racing there so yeah can't wait good stuff all right so over to coach's couch this week I've got a kind of combo question for us this week Hells because it seems like it seems like people are still struggling across the board to shake off the winter illnesses and usually we see, a, we see a spate of this during the winter very often in the UK, and then it seems to clear up in what we would call the early spring. But there's still a lot of people struggling at the moment, aren't there? Yeah, even at, um, even at work, I know there was more sort of bugs going around just like last week, the week before. So, yeah, it, it is difficult, isn't it, to to know um, when and how to kind of get back into things and, and how long it should take to get back into training after illness and you know, what you should look out for on the way as well. Yeah. And I think it's, it's even more relevant now because I think our brains tell us, you know, it's, we're into the duathlon season. This was my first planned race of the year. This is how my season was meant to go on paper in inverted commas. 
and the temptation to rush coming back from an illness is massive. And so we've got a few pointers here for you to to kind of calm you guys down when you're on the way back from from coming back from illness. So the first thing is don't be in a rush to hurry back from illness. If you're sick, you're sick and you can't get well and get fit at the same time. In fact, if you try and do hard training when you're not properly well again yet, you're just going to lengthen how long it takes for you to come back from illness. So accept it's going to take as long as it takes. It might take another week from now, whenever your now is, but you can't rush that. You've got to give your body the chance to get over it. So do all the sensible stuff. Take all the extra vitamins. If you've had an illness that's lingered and you've resisted going to the doctors, get to the doctors and get checked out and see if the doctor thinks you need to get antibiotics for it because there have been so many hideous bugs around this winter that have needed antibiotics. Get that in you and then take the time to come back properly afterwards. The next thing I think helps is and it's hard for triathletes to hear this, but you need to stay out of the pool longer than you think you need to. You can jump back on the bike and do a really easy recovery spin on the bike. And even when you're you're not quite well yet, as long as you're in the little ring and you're spinning your legs really gently, and you're not out of breath and you don't raise your heart rate, you'll feel like you're doing a little bit of something. Your your recruitment patterns in your muscles are going to get fired up again, but you're not going to put any aerobic stress on your body. You can't do that in the pool. You can't do that running. And you've got the risk of all those nasty germs in the pool as well. So definitely stay out of the pool for longer than you think too. And a couple of other little tips we've got. Um, I'd say take an extra seven days if you have to to come back from illness. It's no drama this time of year. When you do get back into your training, resist that urge to test the top end because I so often see an athlete getting back on the bike and they're like, okay, I did the easy spin yesterday. So today I just did one minute at 380 watts just to test and see how I was feeling. Don't do that. You don't need to test to see if your top end is still there. You can do all that testing in two or three weeks time. And when you have made your, all right, I'm well again and I'm going to come back, just watch out for any unusual soreness in your thighs, any unusual soreness anywhere else in your body. Watch out for unusual sleep patterns and accept you're going to have to take a little bit of extra time rather than racing back into it. So the season will still be there. Yes, you might have to miss your first race of the season, but you can put yourself in a real hole by trying to train hard. It can last six months or more if you try and come back too hard when you've been properly sick. So take it easy, guys, and chill out and look after yourselves when you're coming back from illness. Totally. And it's like when you when you maybe have been off work with illness and it's that decision when to go back. And oh, I did it twice this year. Uh, or no, once this year, once last year. That's a very noisy motorbike there, isn't it? <laughs> and um, <laughs> and I just remember, I think I like worked from home a couple of days and then I thought, oh, I feel better. And I tried to go into the office and I was like, I feel horrendous and then had to go home again and then had to take more days off because I tried to go back too soon. So you can sort of relate it to both parts, can't you? The actual training and the actual just generally getting back on your feet again. Exactly. Yeah, you absolutely can't get fit if you're not well. And a super real good rule of thumb is if you've had some time off work, you need at least three days after you've gone back to work before you get back on the bike because or back training at all because if you've been so sick you've had time off work your body's really taken a battering so you've just got to accept it takes as long as it takes i think totally and you, when you are ill you think oh, i'm never going to get back fit again yeah um, but you know what we are here we've been ill this year you do so yeah just trust in yourself even if it takes four complete weeks off and i think the real surprising thing is when you do get back into it Four weeks off is such a long period of time when you're feeling horrendous and you're convinced that you're going to have lost all this fitness. But within a couple of weeks of exercising regularly again, you've almost forgotten you were ever ill. And your body certainly doesn't, you don't have any markers of like, oh, you know, I'm I'm really way down. Just forget those markers for a while and just get back into exercising. And within a couple of weeks, everything's good in the garden again. Love it. Awesome. All right, this week's interview of the week is with Laura Siddle, Ironman New Zealand champion. We've finally managed to get her back on. We hear about her last year, her win in Ironman Australia after we talked to her. It was about this time last year we spoke to her, Hells, actually. So super decent year for her. Win at Ironman Australia. We hear about her disappointments from her only, in inverted commas, finishing 15th place at Kona last year. And uh, some training tips from her as well. So super great interview. Love to catch up with uh, with Laura and great to see her on the top step of the Ironman after all this hard work so here we go here's this week's interview of the week with Laura Siddle 
All right, so really happy to have the wonderful Laura Siddle back on the show. And we're very happy to say, Laura, you're now the Ironman New Zealand champion. So congratulations <laughs> to kick the show off. Well done, mate. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's good to be uh, good to be chatting again. Yeah, well, it's we were just saying, weren't we, before we recorded, that it's been almost exactly a year since we had you on, um, at which point you just finished second at New Zealand last year. So nice to step it up. Progression, oh, oh, progression yeah. continues. <laughs> yeah, definitely, uh, definitely a good feeling. Um, yeah, I was trying to think when the last time we we chatted. So um, feels like I chat a lot more because I'm always emailing with Helen and you guys anyway. So um, yeah, good to be back on the show, and yeah, definitely a a good feeling to take that top spot for sure. It does. Time does fly by, doesn't it? When you look back and go, oh look, a year's gone by already. So uh, so. Oh, yeah. it. Yeah, it goes ridiculously quickly and um, you kind of have to uh, f- force yourself to just take a, take a step back every now and again and actually like look back at what you've achieved or what you've done in the year because so often you kind of you do a race and regardless of the result, it's kind of eyes forward onto the next race and, and moving on and you, you often sort of get, you're so caught up in just the, the training and the process that you actually forget to sort of go hmm, let's just stop a minute and you know think where we were in a few few years ago and what we've achieved since and actually be sort of pretty proud of that yeah well I mean that's the first thing I wanted to kick off with because I, I know a lot of listeners will have heard your story before but um for those of them who haven't I think your story is a great one and that you're not like the traditional came through the British triathlon sort of grew up as a junior and a youth competing as a triathlete and stuff you were a netballer <laughs> right originally a netballer and a hurdler back in the day and then yeah that's switched right to yeah. triathlon later in life so it's amazing to watch the progression to get all the way from someone who took up the sport as an adult wins an Ironman well wins a couple of Ironmans we'll get to <laughs> yeah. Ironman Australia as well so that's that must feel bloody great when you sit back and look at it and go I've gone from just starting this as an adult to to winning a couple of islands, yeah. Australia and New Zealand. You're the the down south champ now, yeah. hey. <laughs> and the and the, the you know the crazy thing is is I still feel you know pretty new in the sport, which is ridiculous now. Really, it's sort of coming up to I guess eight years or so in the sport, but still you know I did start the sport pretty late. Well, very late, really, at the age of 29. Um, I do, you know, I don't talk about regrets much in life, but one. One, I don't know whether you call it a regret or not. I do wish I'd have found the sport earlier. Um, I do wish maybe I'd have been in that British system from an early age and could actually learn to swim properly. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I don't I don't have any. Uh, I probably actually, to be honest, if I'd have, I, I, w- I wouldn't have found the sport if I'd, you know, I only, put it the other way around. I only found the sport through doing the corporate career. Um and it was, yeah, I played a lot of sport as young as a kid and a lot of netball and, yeah, athletics, hurdles and then 400s, 800s. But it was only through my corporate career in engineering that I got a, a transfer out to Australia to work. And um, and it was only once I was in Australia that I suddenly sort of discovered the sport of triathlon because they're all kind of mad keen on it over here or over there. Um, and at that point in the UK, no one – it wasn't really – you know, there was no Alistair Brownlee or Johnny Brownlee. Um, Chrissy Wellington, I don't think, it, she was just about to probably come onto the scene um, when I moved to Australia and was just about and, and was just sort of discovering the sport. So, yeah, as much as I'd like to have found it earlier, I, you know, I wouldn't be here today if I if I had sort of thing. Yeah, and, and also the other thing about that is, of course, if you get into the sport as a slightly older person, you've got all of that injury prevention in your bones already, and and who knows, you might have been burnt out if you'd done it as a kid. There's so many. I'm now I'm now trying to find wood, touch wood. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> as so many do get burnt out after yeah. racing through the teenage years, and and obviously there's this precedent for athletes getting better and better and better as they get. I mean, we could talk about cam brown till the day till the cows come home yeah. couldn't we that's he must have yeah, like six or seven or eight years over you still so who knows man you've got yeah. the best part of a decade going on yet yeah <laughs> yeah i think you know from there's something about playing sport from a young age and it doesn't really matter what sport you play but i guess whilst i started the sport of triathlon late i'd got a lot of training years in me and um you know a lot of that gym work and the strength work and a lot of 
a lot of cross cross um cross training from sports mm. from doing the netball hockey and then doing the athletics as well so I think that probably set me up pretty well and then still sort of relatively new or young into the sport and hopefully a yeah a few more years to keep developing still yeah so listen I'm on New Zealand then Talk us through it, champ. It's been it's been great watching your progression from because uh, there's always this really cool thing when you watch someone who's obviously got talent and you won was it four world championships uh, as an amateur then, going through yeah. sort of sprint Olympic half iron yeah and then you've progressed into the pro ranks and it's always interesting when someone steps up to go right well let's see how they get on here and your progression has continued across what must be I guess five or so years as a pro now and. Yeah. To, to get to the point now where you've won a couple of Ironmans in a year, you're one of the names to beat now. So although you think <laughs> of yourself as a as a, a relative newcomer to the sport, that's it, man. You've won Ironman Australia. You've won Ironman New Zealand. Down down south, you're it. You're the you've got the big target <laughs> on your back. No, I still keep thinking of myself as a pretty newbie and try and fly under the radar a bit. And uh, I was saying to someone the other day, oh no, I don't have the target on my back because I'm so far out the water. Um, after the swim that it's all the people it's all the good swimmers they've got the target on their backs as I start to chase them it's the best um, way to be if you're riding through the field <laughs> you have a you have a great mental mindset all the way through yeah um yeah it's been um yeah you know you had a pretty rapid progression as an age grouper I think um just you know having that sporting background and then suddenly being in a new sport and you can make those steps steps quite quickly which is obviously pretty motivating as well could you see yourself developing and yeah managed you know was lucky enough to win four ti- world titles as an age group albeit oh, only over the sprint two at the olympic distance and then one at the the 70.3 which is when i kind of made that leap to de- turn professional but um you know it's only really been the last 18 months i think i'm coming into yeah my fourth or fifth year as a pro um but it's really only been the last 18 months that, you know, you start to believe and think that you can actually compete. You know, it's and I said it at the time as an age grouper when people were saying, oh, you should go pro and you're beating all these pros in the race. And I'm like, no, I'm not because it's a different race. You know, I'm my time may be, may be beating them on paper, but it's a completely different race and you can't you can't compare. And I think um as much as you can tell age group is that I don't think they realize it until they actually step up and race in the pro races and yeah some people have amazing transitions and they just are able to raise their game or race at that level or they're just uh, got incredible natural talent and ability that they can um make that that level and that step change um for me it's taken you know two three years of just like consistency and to keep plugging away and keep I guess believing or having my coach Matt Dixon um believe in me when you know the race results weren't coming but we're seeing things in training but it was just trying to trying to convert it and then get to that place where you're starting to get the results and and the belief and the and the not necessarily the recognition but just that you know yeah you can you can compete on that level with with the best women in the world and um and you do you know you have you do deserve to be there almost yeah yeah oh totally well it's, i mean it's really interesting to hear your thoughts on this because obviously from the outside it's it's easy for us to look at you and go well there's Laura's progression she's getting faster every year and she's getting higher up the podium every year it's interesting to hear you say you know, I need someone to help me with my confidence with all of this because sometimes I see it in training and I don't see it in racing because, like, I'm not blowing smoke at you when I say you've won Ironman Australia and you've won Ironman New Zealand. That that makes you, like, the big triathlete in the Southern Hemisphere in lots and lots of people's eyes. But yeah. then in your head, it's still like, I've still got to make that leap. I've, is is this a fluke? Yeah. Is it, you know, and I'm sure lots of age totally. go through that as well as they get progressively faster. People yeah. don't believe, do they, that they're that they're improving and that that wasn't just some magical fluke result no you always um it it might whether it's a British thing or not I don't think you always are looking for that oh but so and so didn't have a good race that day or right they yeah they went off their game or I got lucky and, and you kind of always try and justify it that way and don't often give yourself 
um that few moments or those few days to actually reflect and go you know no actually yeah that was a great race or or whatever it was a great performance and that sort of thing and I think you know to win uh, and I going back to your question about Ironman New Zealand um yeah it wasn't my perfect day it wasn't a great that my best performance um but it it did the job to get the win and it's just the most incredible feeling um it's probably you know winning ironman australia was was incredibly special it was my first full distance win um it was in australia which is where i started the sport so um I had so many you know, i've got goosebumps just talking about it but so many kind of friends were there and people that were with me or knew me when i very first started the sport as that as that rookie on the mountain bike with my trainers on kind of thing and and they've seen that that progression they followed my journey and they were all there at the race so and it was again a bit of a monkey off the back because I'd come second a lot in races leading up to to Ironman Australia and so that first win's incredibly special but I think um maybe I'm just an emotional finisher when I when I win but um probably Ironman New Zealand is a bigger race um just with the history it's got in the sport I think you know it's the second oldest Iron Ironman race um also I mean and this is in hindsight afterwards I definitely wasn't thinking about it at the time but you know to be the first British winner of that race given how much history it's got um you know I, I, well, I wish someone had, I'm not sure I could have done much about it but it would have been lovely to go on sub nine hours on that course as well because it's a pretty tough course and uh it was sort of 9.44, but I had no idea at the time in the race that I was kind of so close to it and, look, probably couldn't have done too much about it at that stage was, in the run. 44 <laughs> seconds away, were you? Oh! 44 seconds, yeah. <laughs> and, um, I mean, I did, I did take my time a little bit enjoying the finish shoot, but not, not 44 seconds worth kind of thing. Yeah. So um, it would have needed a lot more work. I mean, I was running pretty scared on that last lap in the marathon. Um well, but let's yeah, talk about I mean, the race a little bit because yeah. it was a real battle, wasn't it? It sounds like yeah. you were you were a little bit down out of the water from where you hoped to be, and then kind of rode through rode through the field yeah. and pretty much took the lead at the halfway point. Is that about yeah, right? Yeah. So they yeah. So they um so they changed the swim course this year, and um, they actually had us sort of coming in at the. Uh, a little bit down the marina um hard to explain if you don't know the course but um that was kind of quite new but um I mean I came out I got into a pretty decent pack in the swim there were four of us were working pretty well together um which was something quite new to me because normally I just swim side by side and slow us both down sort of thing so (laughs) but I knew there were three women off the front I knew one was Teresa she'd be leading it I kind of thought the other ones would probably be at least sell Mark from Australia because she's a good swimmer. And then I'd kind of seen Jocelyn go and I'd, I'd just not been able to go with that initial speed. So I knew those three women were at the front, but didn't know. And, and even didn't know till after the race, like how fast or, or, or how we'd gone in the swim, just got the, the splits that I think Teresa was six minutes and Jocelyn was sort of two minutes. Um but you know, afterwards was pretty happy with that swim. It's definitely better than my late recent swims have been. So um, I'll, I'll do a little plug to Valare wetsuits at that point, mate. I'm hoping it, hoping that my swim ability plus a new wetsuit from them would have uh, <laughs> might have helped. Um, but and then and then got on the bike and um, yeah, the legs weren't there, and that was a little bit like oh. This isn't this isn't what the plan was, you know. Plan A was to do X, Y, and Z, and I'm riding out of town, going, yeah, there's not much in the tank, and or not. And I just kind of at that point went, oh, you know, just be patient a little bit, give yourself sort of ten kilometres to warm up, and use some activation on the hills so as you get out of town, just to hopefully you know the legs will come. And they just, um, I, I won't say they weren't there at all. It was just a, a kind of a solid average leg day if that if that makes sense to anyone and not not what we were hoping for in terms of mm. what I've been doing in training and coming off the back of Wanaka and um do you ride with power so yeah. yeah so yeah. so what you're talking here is like your perception of effort compared to the numbers you were seeing it was because everybody yeah, wants we were... to have that magic leg day where you look down and go oh look yeah, at that I've got right. 50 extra watts or whatever yeah that's so, right. so so um, the power wasn't yeah, easy to come by you... No, not at all. And in fact, I wasn't getting anywhere near the the target that we'd 
we identified for the race um, off pretty good evidence from Wanaka and sessions I'd done. So it was kind of a case in the first sort of 20, and I, and I kept getting splits that I was closing time on the, the two women in front, and then I uh, dropped a whole load of time. And so that first sort of half, it's a two lap bike course, so the first kind of out to the first turnaround, it was very much, uh, all right, stay calm, it's a long day to go, um, just, you know, let's reassess what the plan was, that's not going to happen potentially at the moment. So what can I do now at this moment to ride with what my body's giving me to the best of my ability sort of thing. And um, just sort of staying patient and, and just kind of keep chipping away and, and hopefully just riding, riding as well as I could with what my body was giving me. And yeah, finally sort of on the way back into town, it's a more kind of slight gradual uphill, um, a little, I can't remember what the wind was doing at that point. I think maybe a little bit of a tailwind actually. But yeah, then then sort of started getting the splits to say I was actually pulling the two women up ahead, up ahead back in. Um, and by the time we sort of got to within that 10k of town, um, I could actually see them up the road. So that was kind of then okay. Well, we, it's not that disastrous. Um, you are you are reeling them in and caught the two um Jocelyn and Teresa were pretty much together I think Jocelyn had moved into the lead caught the two as we sort of going around town and headed out onto the second lap um and we dropped Teresa a little bit um and there but then yeah I mean Jocelyn I, I know what she's like as a, as a as an athlete and a rider and I knew it'd be with the way I was feeling on that day I knew it was going to be pretty hard to uh to put in the big efforts that I needed to um, to be able to drop her. So it was just kind of, well, I'll just keep winding the screw and see how much I can hopefully damage her legs, knowing what her running capacity is. is. Um, I mean, you know, I, ideal and perfect world. I didn't want to get off the bike with Jocelyn. Um, and I'd like to be in a few, giving myself a few minutes buffer, but, you know, you have to kind of then adapt and, and manage that. Um so yeah, so then we, so I came into take T2 and Jocelyn was kind of about 10, 20 seconds behind me. I think Teresa was another minute further back. Um, got out onto the run and oh, I don't know. He, it, yeah, it was kind of, you know, I guess in my head I was like, well, at some point Jocelyn will come past me. She's a sub three hour caliber runner. Uh, I'm not there at, at this point yet, but um you know, so at some point she'll catch me, but I won't think about that at the moment. I'll just try and settle into my my running, doing some of the work we've been doing in training. And I was sort of out. It's a three lap course for, for New Zealand. And so out on that first lap, I was getting splits saying, you know, you're holding her. It's about it's staying at that 20 seconds and things like that. So I was like, right, well, we'll just keep keep trucking away at this and see how long I can hold her off. Um which lasted till about 10k <laughs> and, then, and then suddenly it was like uh and, well funnily enough suddenly you you don't get splits because they there's no point in them saying well she's like a meter behind you now and oh look she's on your shoulder um so yeah Jocelyn overtook me about 10 yeah about that 10k and um yeah you do, you do have thought and I could probably did that sort of out of body experience thinking or oh, everyone watching this is going to be like, oh, that's it. Jocelyn's going to run away with the win now and, and that sort of thing. And um, But I kind of, I, I kept sort of, yeah, kept my rhythm, my pace. I can't remember whether I upped the effort or the pace a little bit to sort of go with her. I'm sure I did naturally and instinctively just as, as she'd passed. Um, but I wasn't super high in energy I guess what I did was just ensure that I was taking on the calories and the fluid and the nutrition at that point in the race um and and she got to about 50 meters ahead of me I think or again that sort of 20 seconds ahead or 10 seconds maybe maybe it wasn't that much but then didn't really get any further away and we kind of held that pace um and then heading out onto the second lap um again I, I guess I found a bit of strength again and found my rhythm a little bit better and um yeah just was looking at the road and the, I could see sort of the orange vest of the the lead biker who was sat just behind Jocelyn and going oh they look like they're getting nearer again sort of thing they're not stretching away they're actually look to be getting closer and um and again yeah and they kept sort of getting closer and closer and suddenly it was kind of 
get, yeah, going from sort of that 20 meters to, oh shit, I'm on her shoulder and I'm running past and we we're going up a bit of a hill and it was kind of like, yeah, well, don't, don't look back, just keep running forward. Um, fully expecting Jocelyn to come with me, um, fully expecting her, yeah, not to let me go. So I was just like, well, just keep, keep, keep moving forward. Don't, don't look over your shoulder. Just, you'll be able to hear her if she's there. <laughs> um, and you'll get the splits. And um, then there was a slight panic that, oh, shit, I've still got half a marathon, <laughs> half a marathon to go. And maybe that was a bad idea. Maybe I have surged by uh, unintentionally and um, we'll get around the corner and kind of blow up. Um, but, yeah, just then we're starting to get the the information that I was putting a gap on her um, and stretched away. And then so I'm giving you the really long version here. but um. No, but this is good because it sounds like, because when I, I read the race report, it sounded a bit like exactly as you described it, you kind of found yourself back on her shoulder halfway through the race. And it's like, oh, well, I wasn't expecting this to happen because yeah. it's a, it's a pretty, it looked as the splits were going on on race day, it looked to me like you'd put a surge in and you were, you were trying to, I thought what a ballsy move that is trying to break someone at the half marathon <laughs> point. And I put myself in your place and thought, wow, if that was me, I'm not sure I'd be putting a surge in with 30 miles to go, so good on you. So once well, once you found yourself in front, it sounds like you had, like, that's it. I'm all in. I'm going. Yeah, pretty much. I think, because, I, like I said, I don't think I intentionally put a surge on. I mean, I was trying to obviously keep as close as I could to her and not let her stretch away from me. Um, but I think probably naturally, if you get that little bit of – sniff of like oh they're coming back to you I don't know whether you you do up it a little bit and I was trying to stay relaxed and calm and just go you know like just keep you you, you're reeling her in so just keep going at the same pace you don't need to change anything um but yeah then overtook her and it was like oh yeah okay well this is it now we're just gonna have to keep going at this and (laughs) see how long we last and um you get at each of the uh, there's a couple of opportunities on the lap that you can kind of see where the other competitors are and one of them sort of is at the end of the lap you come back into town and through all the crowds and go around sort of a dead turn and so I was running back out to start my third lap going right this is the first time I need I'm going to clock where Jocelyn is and I kind of surprised myself when I was like oh she's kind of further back than I was expecting and I was like oh that that's kind of cool that's (laughs) and I gave myself a little little bit of a boost and I then about a split second later shat myself because (laughs) I saw Jocelyn and then immediately coming around the corner was Teresa in third and I was like oh no that's not good then (laughs) (laughs) and you kind of have this you have this thought of obviously you see third place catching second so you think that they're moving a lot faster rather than and so your brain thinks oh they must be catching you rather than it might be that second has gone backwards yeah. to third, if that makes sense. Um, so, and then I was getting, yeah, for the whole last lap, so the last 14K, I was just getting reports going, um, she's catching you, she's catching you, you can't let up, you've got to run the best like 10K of your life. And I'm like, oh, it's not not as if I'm not trying already sort of thing. And, uh, and then you get some people being like, relax, relax, you've got it, you're fine. And she's catching you, she's catching It was just this like, <laughs> oh my god I've still got 14 k's to go and um yeah who knows what's going to happen but um yeah just keep yeah like you said all in I'm all in now and you know I did I did think that you know they might catch me and it might be second again and um but then I thought oh do you know what if they've caught me then they're running really well and they deserve to win and I'll be super happy with my performance and they deserve to get that victory and then I was like but (laughs) I'm gonna make it effing hard for them to get there and so it was kind of keeping the keeping the foot on the gas as much as I could at that stage in a in a run and yeah just uh hoping it it would carry me through to the finish and that's it so we've got we've got two Ironman victories I'm gonna say in a year because it's like it's within a 12 month period isn't it it's within a year that's that's good so what's next for you then in terms of the progression now we've got you've got yourself you consistently a podium finisher now you're consistently an Ironman winner what's the next step in your progression because I'm sure you've sat down with your coach Matt Dixon and you know it sounds like you didn't even have a particularly you know 
you had a great race, but you didn't have the yeah. legs you wanted on the bike. And, yeah. and so it sounds like there's more performance there than, than we got to see on race day. Yeah. And that, and that's what's next. That's kind of the bit that's still exciting is that um, we know with the work we're doing and where we're progressing, that there's still from the performance um, in Taupo, there's still a lot more in the tank to come on the bike and then still be able to run that strong, strong run off it. You know, there's lots of, there's lots of things I need to work on for sure. You know, I need to st- still keep um, evolving and improving my swim. That's probably the the hardest and the most frustrating um, trying to see the, see the results of the work I'm putting in and it just, yeah, not, not quite getting out that consistent swim of where I feel it should be. Um, so still lots to work on there, which I'll keep chipping away at. Um, like I said, the bike's starting to get there, but um, again, we we think there's still kind of a few more watts there in the tank, um, which is exciting. And hopefully the sessions that I've been doing lately are starting to give me the confidence of what I can put out in a race. Um, and that sort of thing. And then, you know, still, you know, to be competitive against the best women in the world, you really need to be that three hour marathon mark. And so, you know, I've still got, five minutes to to find in a marathon yeah. off the back of a strong bike so um that's that's what's next in terms of that keep evolving keep developing keep pushing to get really eke out every bit of potential or ability or on, on race day and and get those tactical race awareness as well and keep learning and taking those experiences away yeah and it sounds like you've obviously done a huge amount of work on your bike and, and that's continuing to evolve. I know you're a, you both, you and Matt are, are both sort of very keen on taking care of all the details. So, you know, you love in the, is it the Sipo bike that you're riding still? Yep. Yep. So I'm on Sipo. Um, Cause you look great. great. The photos look, you look so aero and that you've got like the race suit on and you you look like a like <laughs> a prop yeah look like a proper time trialist on that so that's obviously working for you how much yeah. of a part do you think that plays in your performance how much of a part yeah um oh i think it's a huge it's a big part i mean i mean the bike's obviously a big element to the to the race so and it's probably you know it probably is my strength so the more i can get the trained potential out on on race day um i will have to you know again on the bike front that's been a lot of work with paul buick who yeah. is sort of coach with matt and he's based down here in christchurch new zealand which is one of the reasons i first came down here sort of three years ago to work with him more on a face-to-face front and then just you know love it down here but he's he's an absolutely exceptional bike coach and just that attention to detail and learning how to ride your bike over the terrain you know it's it's okay having an ftp of whatever score and being able to smash out however many watts but if you can't convert that into outdoor terrain management um you know it's kind of irrelevant it's you know for example i've done races before where my average watts for a race have been 20 watts lower than a competitor and I've ridden five, 10 minutes quicker mm. um, because it's not just about smashing out those watts. It's how you distribute the watts over the course uh, and over the terrain. And so, you know, Paul's fantastic at that. And hopefully that's something um, I've been working on and, and will, yeah, continue to, to develop. Yeah. Well, what's, let's see if we can get a little tip out of you here, because I think it's something that it obviously fascinates everybody who, who's into the geeky stuff. What's yeah. one thing you'd say you'd learned from, from working with Paul then to do with how to distribute your power as you're riding, if that's not some kind of like NASA classified secret that you'll have to kill me <laughs> once, once you tell me? What, what's made the big difference to your riding? Because you're obviously, you know, you're obviously it's... going really well on the bike, but you're doing it in a way that lets you run really well as well. Yeah, you know, I don't think it's it's actually just learning to ride your bike. You know, I think, and these are sweeping statements I'm making, so I'm going to put that disclaimer out there. You know, I I think a lot of people just get, you know, they train and they just think it's about smashing out the biggest watts. But it's what I've learned with Paul is like, 
how do you manage that slight rate rise and that slight gradient or a bigger gradient or a bigger hill? Do you use a low cadence? Do you use a high cadence? What gear, what power can I put out? How does that high cadence affect my heart rate? And so how many times do I want to use that? Um, you know, I'm a naturally more of a lower cadence person, but I have to work on the the extremes of range to be able to get that. And it's about having then developing a set of skills that you have or a toolbox that you can then um, then pull out in the race. You know, other things like cornering and descending and the technical thing. You know, I <laughs> I don't ride on an indoor trainer. I hate it. Can't stand it. So. <laughs> All my riding is done outside on the road. That's on because the you terrain. live in the summer, twelve That's years the, round. No, I, know. <laughs> I, I do appreciate this, and I look. I have to say, um, I do see the value of indoor trainers. Um, obviously, particularly for people who aren't as fortunate as me and can't follow the sun. <laughs> Um, but also the time, you know, that time starved corporate athlete. You know, they are fantastic uses of time. But I do think you lose a terrain management element of distribution of those watts and the totally. skills to do that. Yeah. 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 And it's often a question I get. And sometimes I give my athletes a set for the trainer that's got different cadences and different positions. And they're like, why are we doing this? Why am I, why am I footling along in zone two standing up? Why am I doing a big gear in zone? Well, what's the point of this? And it's exactly that. If you've got to be indoors during the winter, and you just ride on Zwift at 80 revs a minute yeah. for, for six months, you're going to lose that ability to, you never do that outdoors. Like the terrain's yeah. always changing every hundred meters, yeah. isn't it? So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's so good to hear someone say that. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's really interesting. And that's, and that's how you do it. I mean, that's the best way you can take that terrain indoors um, at, 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 by doing those changing of cadence and, and the different zones. And, you know, I haven't, haven't yet been on Zwift and I'm I think that's probably the only thing that would get me on an indoor trainer <laughs> and I'm try, quite intrigued to uh, have a go um but I think from what I hear you know that's a lot better probably because of the way the courses work and um I'll tell you a funny story about Zwift actually I was um when I was in San Francisco living there oh, when I first moved over and I my local hangout was the Rafa coffee or the Rafa shop because they had a coffee shop in the shop and it was the only place in america or in san francisco that i found actually did decent coffee um and it was around the corner so i'd sit on this sort of mezzanine layer with my laptop and have a coffee and stuff and i was sitting there one day and they were setting up this thing and they'd got like four different trainer wind trainers and bikes and a big tv screen and all this and i was chatting to the guys going oh you know what what's going on here and they're saying oh it's launching this new um this new product called zwift and I was like, oh, what's that about? And they were telling me, and I was like, that's never going to work. Who's going to want? <laughs> Who's going to want to have like a video game, like cycling? Like, surely that, you know, that's never going to take off. It's just one of these gimmicks. Oh, how wrong was I? <laughs> so, yeah. so, listen, the last thing, the last thing to ask you about here is I know you weren't happy with your performance in Kona last year. And again, from the outside, 15th place in Kona. Thank you very much. That that ain't bad, fifteenth in the world. But I think yeah. it speaks to a certain like drive within you that you obviously didn't have the race that you wanted anyway. But where do you think? Where do, I know it's a hard question to ask. Uh-huh. But what would, what would have been a good day for you that day? What what were you thinking? If everything goes perfectly, where did you think you could get yourself yeah. to that year? Um, and, and where will you be this year? Yeah. So on on a perfect day in Kona. Um, which, you know, it, it's hard because everyone wants that perfect day. And, and there's so many, you know, you are racing the best women in the world. But we felt the way training had been going. I was actually in better shape leading into Kona than I had been sort of going into Roth and in the middle of the year and that sort of thing. It was definitely a top 10 goal. And on a good day, if everything went to place and, you know, a few of the people obviously had their explosions or whatever, I guess, you know, that that top knocking on the door of top five was like that outside outside chance we that we thought was a a definite possible well definite possibility a, a, an option um uh, you know but that top 10 was the goal which I think you know I think it has to be for a lot of the women that go there you know yeah, otherwise it's you, you want to make that top 10 you know the rest are feel a bit yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and like you said you know you have to sit back and go yeah 15 in the world 15th in the world yeah I've got to be I've got to be pleased with that and you 
you know, if I look across to the men's results and I see some of those, they're the names that are huge names in the sports and they were lower than 15th or whatever it was. Um, but I think it's hard when you kind of, you see it yourself and, and um, or you try and live it yourself, especially when you had, oh, I mean, you don't, you can't preempt or you try to pre guess what you want you've still got to be very focused driven but yes you've got that kind of goal of if if everything goes to plan that would be that would be a great result um but you know as with any of these things when you don't get you know often you learn more from the races that you aren't happy with and so I took huge learning although it took me a while to get over it but (laughs) huge learning um, away from that experience and um you know, I missed a huge opportunity at the start of the bike and, and that probably then sort of had, had the big effect on my day. And um, Yeah, what was the opportunity you felt you missed? That was in your blog. What Was it to ride yeah, with someone? And, and... Yeah, okay. yeah. So as Kaiser, I think it was Kaiser, Sally and Heather Jackson um, came up on me on the first bit of the course, which I had felt was a a good bit of the course for me. It's a loop round town and should have been sort of a good opportunity to actually put time into people. And so they, they came up with me and I should have snapped and gone with them, whatever the cost kind of thing. And just, cause once you're on that highway out to on the queen K it's so hard to make time or lose time. Cause everyone can ride that section very similar, yeah, you know, okay. if everyone's on the day. So that was one of the the big opportunities and i and i think the other the other thing i learned and this is the bit that kills me probably the most because i kind of pride myself in being quite good at this um was i just i got caught in between trying to dumb the race down to be it's just another race and then the hype and everything that goes with it. So I kind of feel I got caught in this no man's land of trying to play it down and saying, yep, it's just another race. It's just swim, bike, run. No different from all the other races you've done in the year, which is stupid because it is different. It's the world championships. It's in Kona. So yes, you've got to think it is just swim, bike, run. You're doing the same thing, but it is a different race. (laughs) But then I also, I didn't let the energy lift me and motivate me. Um, because I was trying to like quash it down so I kind of and then I probably and that's a bit I don't like I probably overcommitted to um, events and activities and sponsor requirements before the race Um, I love doing that sort of stuff I feel it is part of my job it also gives me energy a lot of the time and it does actually feed and fuel me into a race Um, but I think I and as as much as i thought I'd planned and prepped and front loaded the the two weeks in Kona with all those commitments um I think it probably just didn't give I didn't give myself enough of enough time for myself leading into the race Mm. and so yeah they were probably the the two kind of big learnings from there okay are you going to go back this year is that the plan will you go back will you go back in two years well (laughs) Um, not that you have to I'm, decide now on air in March <laughs> again funny story because obviously the new qualification to Kona comes out in 2019 and I've been quite um, standoffish about whether I think it's a good thing or not I think there's ulterior motives there um, but I'm kind of and I'm not sure how it's going to work out for the pros and that sort of thing so I've kind of been a little bit I'm not sure if this is a good idea or mm. not this slots of qualification However, having one Ironman New Zealand, if it was that this year, I'd have been in. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd had my automatic qualification, so I might change my mind on that. But um, I'll, look, I still need points to get there. Um, yes, I'm probably sitting pretty high at the moment, but that's it's the start of the year and not, really, no, not many people have started racing yet. Um, I have a feeling I'll probably be borderline this year um, for points to go. Um I'll need some more points from Ironman Australia, which is in six, seven weeks or so. Um, and look, if I if I get the points, um, the chances are I will go. I'm kind of I feel I've got unfinished business there. Um, 
to go back but then I'm also kind of yeah I'm a bit mixed but I'm sure I might just be protecting myself at that point (laughs) for now Um, I'm sure if I get the points I will probably go Um, if I don't get the points I'm not going to chase Ironman races over the summer to try to chase points to to just to get there um you know I'll, I'll go over to Europe I'll race the challenge series again in Europe this year um because I, I really love that and, and enjoy that and we'll just see how mm. see how things go from there yeah so the plan is I'm in Australia defend the title and then will you head back to Roth again yes yep so I've got Brilliant. um challenge Melbourne challenge Melbourne coming up and that's a half distance um end of April and then I'll head over and up to yeah challenge uh, challenge Ironman Australia and then after that I'll head over to Europe and do the challenge series in Europe yet yeah, with challenge Roth uh in the middle of in the middle of that summer or yeah roughly <laughs> nice hey listen just to wrap up give us a, a quick shout out to your sponsors for the people who support you because it's it's damn hard making a living as a professional triathlete so who are the guys who help you out and and we can push some bling onto uh, onto the listeners uh-huh. Oh, I, I will say that. And I, I think I have got quite a few discount codes that should work in the UK as well. So most of them awesome. are on my web most of them are on my website, which is laurasiddle.com. But um yep, yeah, Scody do my awesome race kit, which I then make sure my SIPO bike colour coordinates and matches. So um they do, they they've been really great to work with. Uh Shots Nutrition, um they're also they've supported me from being an age grouper, which has been fantastic, but they are an Australian Australian company but they do my energy gels and hydration um started coming I've come on board with Hoka this year which has been fantastic I've been really impressed with working with them I'm actually yeah supported sort of between the European guys and and New Zealand um but that's been fantastic I wore their trainers all of last year and then um just by my own choice and then sort of managed to uh to develop the relationship after that uh who else cask helmets um which are also also love um skins compressions ah oh, sock mine there we go that's a good uk company they are obviously name the clue is in the name um but they're a re- they're a local company that's based about 10 minutes from where i was born um in mansfield and they do their manufacturing in the uk so they are totally, totally made in UK. Um, their socks are also awesome. They have a little Union Jack on the back of them, which is pretty cool. So I always that's uh, you'll see me wearing those in in nice. training and racing. <laughs> and I think the code I think the code for that is sock mine Sid. But um, yeah, have a look on there. And they do all oh, yeah ski. Oh, actually, they do uh, snow socks as well, which is probably good for all you guys at probably the moment over there right in the now, UK. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and um, Raider Stein tires, which um, yeah, they've been awesome to work with the last few years. Be a little, bit, a little bit less known. Good. Hey, well, it's it's nice to give you a chance to give a shout out to the people that help you because I, I should probably say Matt Dixon and Purple Patch and Paul Buick. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll get shot for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we already talked about those guys a lot anyway. Yeah. Because it's a it's a great relationship, and I think it's awesome that you're still with the same coaching relationship that's helped you you know progress and progress across the years and and it's certainly working for you whatever you guys are doing you're still making forward steps so keep doing what you're doing right yeah and I think you know that's probably a learning for most people I think people often pick a coach and expect a, a magic pill or something and and for some people it works and you can have that instant progression and that change just from having new fresh eyes and stuff and but for us it's definitely been a a progression and a development over the years as Matt's worked out, Matt and Paul have worked out what sessions work for me or don't work for me and what, how I handle things differently to the other athletes. So yeah, it's been a, it's been good. It's been good. Awesome stuff. Hey, well, listen, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations again on the, on the wins over the past year. Oh, and, thank you. And we'll look forward to, to more of your victories, hopefully, fingers crossed, a defence. <laughs> I'm in Australia and, and who knows, maybe we get to go one step higher at Roth this year as well. That would be pretty damn cool. Oh, that'd be pretty amazing. I think, oh, I think you, uh, yeah, you appreciate and you never take for granted any win. So, um, yeah, just uh, keep the head down and keep plugging away. And, uh, yeah, it's always good to talk to you guys. And thanks for the support from everyone over there. And, 
maybe I should try and get a, a get over for a race in the UK sometime soon. Yeah, come over and race I am in the UK and get your fillings loosened yeah. on our whole yeah. road over here. <laughs> oh, Port Macquarie is pretty bad, so and, and New Zealand roads. <laughs> All right, it's Laura. not exactly quite the exotic location that I go to with racing. <laughs> Sorry, everyone in Bolton. I've heard it's amazing. The crowds are amazing. It is heard. honestly, it's, it is. It is. No, it's, 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 yeah. It's an amazing race. The the, the crowds and stuff there yeah. these days is is yeah. incredible. So yeah, it'd be good Which to have fantastic. your race. Come visit us. It's, Come visit Oxygen it. Addict headquarters, um, and we'll put you up, man. It's fantastic to see the sport growing like that in the UK and to hear the stories that come back from Ironman UK and, and that's the thing and, and Wales and, and then the local races. Yeah, it's uh yeah, it's pretty it's pretty cool to see. So I do need to get my arse in gear and, and get over to back to the UK to race. It's only a short hop over from Germany. You just remember that. That's it. <laughs> all right, Sid, so listen, all the best, mate, and we'll catch up with you again soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great to watch her progression over the last couple of years, hey? Watch her gradually climb up the ranks. And uh, I'm really impressed that she's not she's not happy with 15th at Kona, you know? She just wants yeah, more. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. And she, you know, she, she knows she's capable of more. Her coaches will know she's capable of more. Um, and so, quite rightly, she'll want to, at some point, um, give it another crack, whether that's this year, whether it's next year, whatever. But... Um, yeah, I, I know that she will want more, and especially having had so many sort of decent results as well. Um, and then you do want to show everyone what you're capable of. Yeah. Um, so it was brilliant. So, so happy for her when she won Ironman New Zealand, you know, after a <laughs> lot of um, f- finishing on the podium, uh, but not, not on that spot. So, yeah, so so happy for her and especially because she spends you know a lot of her time uh, living and training out there as well and and obviously there's a real sort of fond fond place in her heart for the whole country so yeah brilliant and she's such good value we can all learn so much from her and um she's always got time for people as well and when she came to to try club rob back in the summer when she only was in the UK for you know I don't know ten days or whatever at that point, and she still took the time to come and and teach us a little bit about core and talk to us about what it takes to you know train and race and, and be a professional. So yeah, brilliant always. To... It's also a good well, sign it was as well. Funny actually, I, I picked. Sorry, go on. <laughs> no, no, no. What? So we talked over each other there. Your, your Skype dropped out just for a second. I was going to say it's especially great that she took the win in the manner that she did on the day when it sounds like she didn't have good legs particularly and the day when she got caught on the run and the mental self-talk that went on all the way through it to not give up and not fold and not think, well, I've been beaten now. To come back after being overtaken at that point in the run, I think shows amazing resilience and it's exactly the kind of... You know, mental approach that's going to help her win stuff at the very highest level. Definitely, and and you know, okay, some people have bucket loads of mental strength and resilience from day one, but I'd say they're probably few and far between those who do have that. And others, it takes experiences from different races. It, it takes you know having bad races that you learn from. It takes all those down moments to then actually build up your mental resilience and your mental strength and and put it into practice and actually then that confidence in yourself that you know that you can do it. Totally. Yeah. Applicable to every age grouper. No question. Exactly. Right, a little bit of news for you guys this week then. A couple of things that we've seen on the circuit coming out. First up, Ali Brownlee to race China 70.3. So he's having a little stop off on the way home from Australia from the Commonwealth Hills. Yeah, that's right. So he'll be racing, uh, trying to defend his Commonwealth title. uh, And then in the uh, mixed relay event on the 7th of April. And then he will head over to China where he's going to do the 70.3 Lijou race. Um, Mark Buckingham and Crowey are also due to to do that race. And Robert, it sort of makes sense because he obviously had that win at 70.3 Dubai, but he will still need to qualify for the Ironman 70.3 World Championship. So heading over to China, sort of on the way back to the UK, 
or back to Europe um, makes yeah makes absolute sense to get some more points in in the bag and, and sort of get cement his place on that start list. Yeah, get that sorted out. Other news: Rinny to race Cairns again on the way back from uh, her motherhood break. Yeah, I uh, so Rob usually when I you know I'm looking for some news or stories or whatever. Um, Google brings up UK-based stories, but obviously being in Australia, it sort of threw me some, some <laughs> little Aussie beauties. So, um, yeah, so she will do Ironman Cairns on June the 10th. It'll be her only full Ironman distance race before Kona. Um, she'll be making her comeback uh, at 70.3 Texas. Uh, she obviously had baby Isabel back in August um, and she last won Kona in 2014, Rob. She's now 36, but she says, I believe it is possible to do it all and do it exceptionally well. I hope I can inspire, I can help inspire other mums and dads to do the same. Nice. And one final bit of news here, which I think is brilliant. We had her on the show a couple of years ago. Do you remember Caroline Bramwell? I do, Rob. I do, because I remember she was going to be doing Ironman UK the year that I was going to be doing Ironman UK. So That's right. Really, yeah, really inspiring woman. Um, she has a stoma, doesn't she? She has, um, yeah. She was and- hospitalised with ulcerative colitis and then had surgery to have a permanent ileostomy. And she races with that, which is just phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it was really, really inspiring to get her on and um, and just to see her, you know, loving it and being able to do it and loving life as well, giving it, giving her her life back. So she's just released her autobiography called Lou Rolls to Lycra, the Iron Man Dreams <laughs> of an ID Sufferer. So you can find out more about that book over ironostomy.co.uk. Um, great to see her there and great to see her being supported by Hoob as well. They've sponsored her as well, which is, I love it when companies do things like that and sponsor people who are inspirational and not just fast, you know. So congratulations to you, Caroline. It's great to see. Definitely. All right, so one last little bit from us before we wrap up this week's show. Patrons, thanks very much for your support over the last year. We've edited our bits and bobs together. The Patrons podcast is going to come out this week. We're going to send you a link where you can download the Patrons podcast. It won't be through iTunes. It'll be through a private link, this one. So um, so thank you all very much. If you guys would like to become a patron, you'll then get access to the Patrons Only podcast as well. You can do that by clicking on the link either in the show notes through iTunes or Stitcher or wherever or on our homepage and you can choose to support the show either with a monthly donation or an annual donation just follow the links that are on the page and that would be very much appreciated by both Hells and I so Hells what have you got lined up then for the rest of your week so the next couple of days going to see uh, more rallies going to the beach tomorrow Uh, hopefully a little bit more running Uh, I need to pick up my Commonwealth Games accreditation uh, start work Um, so it's going to be a very very busy I'm hiring a bike Rob as well very excited by this nice yeah so hopefully 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 I will get especially the first couple of days hopefully I'll be able to um, get a little bit of pedaling in I'm not expecting to go far at all but at least it gives me options um and check out a few more 50 meter outdoor pools that would be that'd be great fun nice um yeah just enjoy enjoy being here and um rob two things i wanted to mention one of them being i did do uh, an aussie themed playlist for my last spin class before i flew out here so wednesday night we had the nuts for tri club um absolutely loving or maybe i should just say laughing at some of the tunes that i had on the go so just think stereotypical songs and that you're pretty much there so yes we had jason donovan yes we had the home and away theme tune very fun (laughs) if anyone wants it sounds like hell (laughs) (laughs) so if anyone wants it just you know let me know i can sure i can share it somehow and um yeah rob i was gonna say actually I thought uh, I got in touch with uh, Laura actually to ask her for some tips for flying because I knew, especially over to this part of the world, because she does it quite a lot. She has done it quite a lot. And I had sort of said, look, do you have any tips for for the flight? Because I wanted to make the most of the weekend just gone because I was going to be able to see lots of relatives and stuff and I didn't want to be a total zombie. And um, 
very helpfully my flight landed at 8 p.m so that was good but it was a 13 hour flight over to singapore and then a seven hour flight from singapore down to brisbane with about an hour and a half in singapore airport so and we left manchester at 11 a.m um on the thursday so um a few tips, Rob, I just thought might be handy. And this is partly from Laura, but also partly uh, what I did uh, as well. Nice, yeah. So I actually decided to cut out caffeine the week leading up to my flight. So the flight was on a Thursday and I decided to cut out caffeine on the Monday purely because I knew I wasn't going to drink loads of caffeine on the flight. And if you don't drink caffeine, you get a banging headache so I thought I'd prefer to have the banging headache um, early on in the week when at least I can cope with it I'm at home you know still working but fine I can I can cope with it uh, so I think that definitely helped I took some melatonin Rob oh how uh, did that work out for you <laughs> brilliant <laughs> within, within 20 minutes of taking it I felt really dozy so it did it did its thing um and okay. I think a friend had got it from, it sounds really dodgy, doesn't it? But it's obviously a natural um, sleep yeah. uh, sort of a thing. So, yeah, took some of that, felt really drowsy. So, essentially, I pretty much dozed on that flight to Singapore because I put my watch to Australia time. So, spent that flight dozing. I didn't watch any films. I was just... I listened to a few podcasts, but I didn't even have like the flashy lights in front of me because I wanted to get onto Aussie time. Um, and then, yeah, I just drank lots of water. Uh, I did try to also adapt some of the eating to Australian eating times as well. So I made sure I had some snacks on the plane. Um, and then I tried to keep awake for that second flight. So on that second flight, I did watch films because that was then during the day, uh, Australia time. And um, yeah, it all seemed to work quite nicely, Rob. Didn't nice. suffer too much. I wasn't Not too bad with the old jet lag. No, I wasn't. I didn't spend you know, Saturday morning awake at sort of 4am for two hours or whatever. I, I, I Honestly, it really did work. And uh, I'm slowly reintroducing uh, a bit of caffeine, but it has totally helped me to cut back as well. So, Brilliant. Yeah. Good there stuff. Go. Good tips. Top tips. Helen's top tips for flying around the world. <laughs> Could see Flora Siddle as well. <laughs> nice work, you two. All right, so listen, that pretty much wraps us up for this week, doesn't it? So you have a fantastic week out in Australia, mate, and we'll talk to you again next week. Uh, a little a little thank you from the birds in the background as well. Thanks very much, the birds. Thank you to our sponsors. We are tribe.co. You can get yourself a, a trial pack of Tribe for just one pound by using the code OxygenAddict1. Also, thanks to our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. You can get yourself a free box or tube of pH worth up to nine ninety nine. Shut up, you! With the code OxygenAddict, <laughs> you can <laughs> you never work with children or animals' health. You can nominate yourself or a friend for the Tribe Trophy of the Month Award by emailing us at helen at oxygenetic.com. And until next month, next week even, that bird's put me right off, Hells. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. I'm Coach Rob Wilby. I'm Helen Murray. And you've been listening to the Oxygenetic Triathlon Podcast. Have a great, safe training and racing week. We'll speak to you all again next week. Cheers, everyone. See ya. See ya.